everyone, John here, Hall Miniatures Great and Small, and today we're going to be doing how to play Pacific Rim Extinction. We're going to be looking at the base game, the standard rules, and we'll go through all of the uh, unit cards, how everything plays, and give you an idea of the game. And hopefully then it'll give you an idea if it's a game you're interested in or not. Alright, first up, just an overview of the game. So the game is based on the Pacific Rim universe, which is, if you don't know already, giant robots fighting giant monsters. We have giant robots called Jaegers fighting giant monsters called Kaiju, and uh, it's a great robot monster, smash them up. And it's a pretty fun uh, game. Basically it's uh, two or more players. Each uh, person is either a Jaeger side or the Kaiju side. And you can build your forces with points. Uh, there is a tournament uh, pack out, I believe, for this game as well. And each Jaeger has uh, upgrades it can take. Each Kaiju has mutations it can take. So there's uh, a little bit of variety in how the game plays. Typically a game lasts from four to six turns. Uh, your st standard mission and that can be uh, things like Kaiju need to destroy buildings in the city, Jaegers need to defend it, destroying each other, uh, missions like that. So pretty pretty straightforward. The first thing we're going to do though is we're going to take a look at the unit cards so you can get an idea of what each unit is and what it's capable of doing. We are taking a look at Gypsy Danger's Conpod and this gives us all of our relevant information about how our Jaeger works. Each Jaeger has a corresponding compod, and uh, these are different based on their stats. So this icon here tells us what faction it is. This is Pan Pacific Defense Force. Green is speed. So for example, Gypsy moves three. Hex is in a turn. The uh, blue is skill. So we have two skill. The red is power and the yellow is armor. Then this white hex with the four in it that is the cost in the game. We also have charge and ammo. So Gypsy has three charge, two ammo. We have a spot here for a upgrade card. We have a spot here for pilots. And then, last but not least, Gypsy Danger can take four damage. So she's pretty tough in, in uh, combat, can absorb some damage. So that's the basics of a Conpod. The Kaiju are set up very similar, but with some differences. So we'll take a look at those real quick. So this is Otachi. And Otachi here has the same type of setup. So it's a Kaiju faction, speed four, skill three, power three, one armor, and four kaiju points. We also have rage, which goes up to two, and kaiju blue, which goes up to two as well. The kaiju have two upgrade slots, one offensive mutation and one defensive mutation. And then Otachi can take up to five damage. So that's pretty beefy. So those are the main differences. Uh, the Kaiju do not get pilots and don't get upgrade cards. They get two mutations. Next, let's look at the upgrade slots. So upgrades come like uh, this. They're just little cards. The back of the card is going to tell you if it's specific to a um, Jaeger. Like, so this can only be upgraded on Gypsy Danger. Or there might be generic ones. So I have two to choose from for Gypsy Danger here in my hand, Street Fighter or Legendary Jaeger. Both of these are Gypsy Danger only. For example, Street Fighter is, while defending or attacking, if you roll one or more triggers, you may spend one charge to reroll any number of blank dice. I'm sure that doesn't uh, mean anything to you guys right now, but it's uh, something to consider. So that would go there if I wanted to upgrade it with the Street Fighter ability. Then next, what we would do is we would add our, our pilots. So our pilots come in cards like this. Gypsy Danger has a spot for two of them. And we line them up. So here I'm putting Yancey and Raleigh Beckett, the Beckett brothers, 
into Gypsy Danger. A couple of things to note on the Ranger cards. One is the cost. So that's again in the uh, hex there. Two points for Raleigh, one point for Yancey. And then we have the uh, Drift Connections and we have any special abilities that those pilots can do. So, for example, what we're doing is we're looking to maximize the number of uh, drift connections. So both of these guys have, you see the A's are connecting, the B's are connecting, and the C's are connecting. So that means if I'm running both of these pilots, I have three connections, uh, three drift connections, which gives me a three plus three bonus on my skill. And since I have a three connections there to remind me I'm going to put this plus three token on my card. Let's me know I have plus three to my skill, which is two. Now, if I didn't have, let's say instead of Yancey, we put Mako Mori in here. Well, we'll see the D and A don't line up, but the B and the C do. So I have two connections. So I'm gonna add plus two to my skill. So you get an idea of what the uh, the pilot connections can do. Next up, each pilot has uh, keywords here. Mako has accurate, disengage, activate chain sword. Raleigh has four other ones. Each one of those is a special ability that if you play the correct card, typically it's called deep drift, um, it can activate all of these special abilities for that activation, which can be pretty powerful. In the game then, we also start with one charge and two ammo, whatever is grayed out on the card. Different Jaegers, again, might have different amounts here. So that is our um, card for our Jaeger set up. Now let's just take a quick look at the Kaiju and just show you how it is a little bit different. So back to Otachi's card, we see that the uh, one for Rage is grayed out, so that's where we're gonna start with our Rage. And full kaiju blue, which is really like magic kaiju blood. And again, here we have a offensive and defensive mutation. So I have a couple of mutation cards. They match. So for example, you could give Otachi tail claw. If you roll one or more triggers while making a melee attack in your rear arc, gain plus one success per trigger rolled and burst of speed. You may remove this mutation after moving during your free move to move an additional number of hexes equal to your speed. So basically you could double up your speed in one turn. Um, so you would place them down like that. Now there are each uh, um, kaiju that you purchase has different cards and these cards for the most part are fully swappable so you can put whatever upgrade you want from whatever other kaiju set you happen to purchase. So that is my um, kaiju card ready to begin the game. Another mechanic to explain is the uh, cards. Basically every Jaeger or kaiju has a deck of six action cards. Um, they're going to play these um, one card uh, a turn. You can use the same card over and over. We'll talk more about how these work in the game, but just to give you an idea, um, they have a customized deck that lets it do certain things like use the chain sword, fire plasma caster, power surge, tactical action, deep drift, vortex turbine. Some of these are um, like almost all Jaegers and Kaiju have something that will let you run or get full charge or full rage for, for Kaiju. So some of these will be simple, uh, similar. Uh, others will be unique to your Jaeger like Fire Plasma Caster or Chain Sword. Not every uh, Jaeger has a Chain Sword. Not every Jaeger has a Plasma Caster. So to figure out how you're going to play the game, you're going to use scenario cards and mission cards. So the way it works is the um, Jaeger player is going to be randomly drawing a mission card, and the Kaiju player will be randomly drawing a Oh, sorry, a mission, a uh, scenario card. The kaiju player is going to be drawing the mission card. There are two types of mission cards. One is just the general mission card. The other is the quick start mission card for just jumping into a battle real quick. 
uh, and they are a little bit different. So for example, the, the Jaeger player might draw this card, surprise attack, special rules, the PPDC has been caught off guard and needs to utilize experimental rocket technology to defend the city. Jaegers coming in from reserve can be placed anywhere on the game mat regardless of kaiju location. Normally reserves come in on the edge. Uh, and so it tells you terrain, one difficult terrain, buildings five, three size skyscrapers and two kaiju shelters and objects four. Those might be things like boats or trucks or something you can use as a weapon. And then it has um, instructions on setup and all that good information. So that's one type of mission card. There's also the quick play, I keep calling these mission cards, these are scenario cards, that are a little bit more straightforward. So this is Chipsy Avenger, this is Shrekthorn. So these are used for more if you just have the base uh, core set and you're playing with the things that are in the, the, uh, the starting box. Then the Kaiju player draws one of these. Hunting grounds. Uh, Jaegers can score the following bonus points. Two points. Uh, two extra VPs if all Jaegers are intact. Two extra VPs if no Jaegers are destroyed. Kaiju can, destroy, uh, can score the following bonus points. One extra VP per non. Leader Jaeger damaged two VP per non leader Jaeger destroyed. So it's just a way to get extra uh, points or a different way to score. So you're going to be surprise attack with the hunting ground special rules in play. All right, so that's how you uh, set it up, and then let's get into actually how to play the game. I've set up the table for the skirmish mission, which is pretty straightforward and it requires three skyscrapers and four objects on the battlefield. The skyscrapers are obvious. The objects are these little hexes with, oh, I dropped that one. You can see it's like a subway car here. Some of these are boats and stuff like that. So once the battlefield is set up, you just follow the card and how you place the buildings and then you follow the deployment. Jaegers on one side and Kaiju on the other. When you put your model down, you can, depending on the scenario, it'll tell you how. For example, in Skirmish, you could put your model up to four hexes in. Now is as good a time as any to expl explain how movement is done or hexes are, are referenced. So you'll notice there's no hexes on the board. However, the uh, models are hex-based and the um, buildings are on little hexes as well to help line everything up. So you use hexes for movement and you'll use this uh, measuring stick. So for, for example that would be four up to four hexes in. So I could start all the way up there if I wanted to. Alright, now let's talk about the game turn. So this is the most important thing. The very first phase of the game you're going to be placing your um, command card or action card next to your model. Both sides do this at the same time. So basically you look at your hand of six cards, at least that's what you get in the starting, and you've got all of these options. So for example, let's say for the first turn, I want to power surge, gain full charge, because my uh, Jaeger does not start with full charge, so I would place my card face down. Once both sides have put a face down card next to each one of their Jaegers or Kaiju, then you go ahead and everybody flips over at the same time. So I see Power Surge for Gypsy Danger and Otachi here flips Rage from above. And if there were, you know, two Jaegers, two Kaijus, you'd flip them all at the same time. The next thing we do is we roll an Impulse die to, to determine activations. By that I mean you look at the board and you see who, which player has the least number of units. We both have one, the Jaeger player and the Kaiju player both have one. In the case of a tie, the Kaiju player will roll the impulse dice. The impulse dice has three results. It has either one activation, two activations, or blank. Um, and an activation means activating a Jaeger or Kaiju and moving it and doing its action. So in this case, the Kaiju player will roll this impulse die and we'll go ahead and roll it. 
and we get a blank, which is interesting. So that means the Kaiju player will not activate anything. The die is then passed to the Jaeger player, and Gypsy Danger rolls two activations. Now granted, in this example, we only have one Jaeger here, but if we had two Jaegers, the Jaeger player would be able to activate one completely, and then the second one completely, before this impulse but die would be passed back to the Kaiju player. And you do that back and forth until um, all the, the players are done, done activating. You can only activate a unit that has a face-up uh, card. So once it's done and that card is flipped back over, you cannot choose that unit to activate again. Therefore, you can only activate a unit once per turn. So let's go ahead and activate uh, Gypsy Danger. So that means we're going to pick this card, Power Surge, and that's what's in effect this turn. Every activation, there is a free move that you can perform, and then you can do the card. So the way the free move works is you look at your Jaeger or Kaiju's movement. In this case, you can see over here it's a three for Gypsy Danger. So that means I can move up to three forward or I can move one hex backwards. Any unit can move one hex backwards. So to measure, it's pretty easy. You put it in here and you do one, two, three. You don't have to move fully um, and you could again go backwards if you wanted to. Now. You might want to ask, well, I want to turn. Well, turning is interesting in the fact that Jaegers can only turn after they're done moving. So the only way to turn is one, two, three, and then do your turn or pivot, as they call it here. Um, so let's say we're just going to move two of our three forward, and then we want to pivot or turn. Now you can turn either 60 degrees or 30 degrees. So if you turn 60 degrees, it's pretty easy. You can just use the gauge and turn it one facing or hex side. If you want to turn it 30 degrees, you can use this kind of jagged cutoff and just move it one angle. Come. Okay. So pretty easy to do. Uh, turns. Kaijus are a little bit different. So when they activate, they can turn either before or after their move. So they could pivot, move, or move, then pivot. Um, things like running, for example, Gypsy Danger can either, now that she's finished moving, she can either gain full charge or run. If I were to choose the run action, I basically get to move again. So I could move up to three forward. One, two, three. Or, and also pivot at the end of that one. Or I could do my other option, which is gain full charge, which I think I will do. So over here on my card, I'm going to go from one to three. With my card done and that activation completed, I can now uh, remove this. I don't leave it face down, if I mentioned that earlier. I just remove it and put it back into my deck of uh, action cards. So we turned this board sideways so we could uh, see this a little bit closer now. So Gypsy Danger has advanced and gotten full charge during this turn. So now it's going to be Otachi's turn to do something. So the card we had played was Rage from Above, which is going to let him either gain full rage or run. Um, but before we do that, let's talk about ranged attacks. Let's say instead of Rage from Above, um, Otachi picked Acid Spray. So here you can see the cost and what type of attack it is. Cost one Kaiju Blue, and it is a ranged attack. If this attack is successful, you may make a second attack against, an, against another target within one hex of the first. If attacking at long range, this attack is at minus two skill. Okay, so let's say we're doing acid spray. So on 
Otachi's card. We're going to drop Kaiju Blue from 2 to 1 because that's the cost of our acid spray. And we're going to check the range. So we use our range ruler. So if our range ruler, if our target is in uh, that range ruler, it's short range. If it's beyond, like this line back further, uh, it would be long range and have a penalty to hit in this case. So we know it's in short range. So now we do an attack. Attacks work the same way whether it's a um, ranged attack or a melee attack. It's just whether you're touching your target or farther away. What you do is you look at the skill. So Otachi has a skill of three. And you look at the melee value and Otachi has a melee or power value of three. So that gives Otachi six dice uh, when she is attacking. Now these dice have a couple of symbols on them. Hopefully we'll roll and get one of each so we can talk about it. If not, we might fudge them here. Okay. So let's say we rolled that. So blanks are pretty easy. Blanks are misses, so we remove those. The exclamation point is a trigger. This orange hit die is a hit, and the red hit die is a critical hit. For a critical hit, every critical hit you get, you get to roll an extra die. So let's roll, and we didn't get anything else. Okay. Now, Triggers don't count as hits, but triggers do allow you to um, perhaps perform special actions. For example, Otachi does have this tail claw uh, mutation. If you roll one or more triggers while making a melee attack in your rear arc, gain plus one success per trigger rolled. So a success would be one more hit. Since I, this is not a melee attack and Gypsy Danger is not in Otachi's rear arc, which is, if you look at a Jaeger or, or Kaiju model, everything in the 180 degrees of the hex is front, 180 degrees to the rear is rear. All right, so we got three hits, which is pretty, or sorry, just two hits, which is pretty good. Now we look at Gypsy Danger's card. Gypsy has a piloting skill. We'll bring Gypsy over. So you can see, has a uh, skill of two, has a defense of two because I'm defending rather than attacking, and because I have two pilot connections here, and this plus two is reminding me, I get two extra dice for my pilot connections. So Gypsy Danger is rolling six dice for defense. You can probably imagine what's coming next. I need to basically roll higher than that. So I got two triggers, three hits, and one critical hit. That's a really good roll, but the critical hit will let me roll again. And we got another success. So we have five successes. The attacker has to beat the defender. So if I have five successes, Otachi would have need six hits to get past my defenses. So Gypsy Danger handles that acid attack no problem. And uh, acid spray would be returned to the uh, Kaiju player's hand and, and uh, the attack would be done. Now, if I had any abilities that triggered from these triggers, uh, those could be potentially used at the same time. All right, so let's say instead of that acid attack, we had death from above, which is gainful rage or run. So gainful rage or run, let's pick run because running is pretty cool. This kaiju can move four hexes. So it can move four and then run four. It can actually cover quite a bit of the, the board. But one, two, and the third one, I'm going to come into contact with Gypsy Danger. Now, 
because I've uh, selected run as my action, even though I haven't done my second move, because I could move four, potentially pivot, move another four, potentially pivot again, since I actually contacted uh, the enemy, my run stops, even though I didn't get to do the second half of my run. And these guys are squared up. And then I can perform a melee attack. Performing a melee attack is part of the run action in that if you get into a base contact with an enemy during the run, you can immediately perform a melee attack. All right, so let's check this out. We are doing the same thing. We have three skill. We have three power. So let's see if Otachi can do a little bit better in close combat. All right, we got three hits and a trigger, which in this case, based on Otachi's cards and whatnot, this isn't going to do anything. And we know that Gypsy Danger is going to get six dice to defend. Two from a skill, two from his armor, his defense, that yellow box, and two from his piloting connections. And Gypsy Danger is on fire with these defense rolls. I don't know if you can see those all, but we had that over there. Okay, so that is um, um, you know three successes versus five successes, so the defender wins and no damage is done. Okay, but let's say that our defender. failed. So if the attacker rolls more successes than the defender, the attack counts as succeeding. Damage is dealt according to the difference between the attacker's result and the defender's result. Uh, let's see, so here we have six versus three, so that means the Otachi wins by three. Three. Um, which results in one damage to Gypsy Danger. Uh, four to six uh, successes over what you need would result in two damage. Uh, seven to nine would be three damage. And if for some amazing reason you could get 10 to 12, you could do four damage in one go, uh, which could be pretty scary. So by just beating them by three though, you're just doing one damage to Gypsy Danger. So Gypsy would present her cards. Otachi would pick one at random, flip over and look at the damage side, shattered blade, no additional effects. So not only is chainsword taken out of the hand so you can't use it anymore, this damage is, is marked. Basically on the card you would line up that damage with the first number. So pretty, pretty straightforward. Now let's say Gypsy didn't get any successes and Otachi did six versus Gypsy's nothing. So six successes over what you'd need results in two damage points being inflicted. So Otachi would have two options. She could choose to draw two of these cards at random or if Gypsy Danger had a face-up card you choose to take that one as the damage instead. That is a very powerful ability because if there's a face-up card, it means that unit hasn't gone yet. So instead of doing two damage to Gypsy Danger, I could do one damage to Gypsy Danger, but take away the face-up action card, meaning that Gypsy Danger is going to lose its activation for the turn. So very powerful uh, because you're depriving that uh, defender of its action later in the turn. But you can only do that if it hasn't activated yet. So once it's activated, this card's gone. There's no face-up card for you to pick. The only thing Otachi could do would be pick two random cards. Cockpit damaged and vortex backfire. Um, and apply those to the, the uh, defender. So... 
A few other things to note in combat is attacking from behind. If Gypsy Danger was attacking this kaiju from behind. Um, when the kaiju is rolling its defense, it cannot add its skill. It can only add its native defense value. So an attack from the forward would result in uh, four dice being rolled for Otachi. From the back, only one die being rolled for Otachi because Otachi only has a one for defensive skill. Another thing to point out is typically an attack from the back if the attacker is in any of the three hex sides on the back arc. The, um, this unit cannot attack, attack back. Um, that said, Otachi has a special card that does let it use its tail attack in its rear arc. But most units cannot attack in their, their rear, arc, rear arc and they'd have to do something else. Either, you know, run away and start pivoting or, or doing something. So just keep that in mind. Attacks from the rear, you don't get your skill bonus. Um, and you can't attack someone from your rear hexes unless you have some special card. Another cool thing you can do is one of the action cards you have is tactical action. Now a tactical action lets you do kind of cool thematic stuff. A tactical action lets you do uh, a melee attack, which is a stand like a standard attack, uh, circle around the enemy one hex, uh, pick up an object, or use an object in a, me a melee or short ranged attack. So moving around the enemy one hex side, if um, you know, let's say Gypsy Danger was engaging Otachi here with this tactical action, I could move one hex side to the side, maybe getting behind my target. Um, another thing you could do is pick up an object. To pick up an object, like this train, you have to be just within one hex range. So you'd pick it up and either put it on your card or put it on the model to remind you that you have this subway car in your hand. On a later activation, you can then do another tactical action to throw it either at short range or in melee and that gives you an extra three power to your attack. So if Gypsy Danger had this subway car in his hand and performs a melee attack against Otachi, normally in this example I would get six dice to attack. For this attack using the tactical action and using my subway car, I would roll nine dice to attack. So as you're kind of approaching together, one of the things you might do is pick up an object to use it once you get in, in melee. And that's so a clever way to increase your uh, dice pool when you're attacking, and it's also pretty thematic uh, in the Pacific Rim universe, using a giant boat as a bat to hit the kaiju. It's pretty cool stuff. Next, let's talk about buildings. Let's say Otachi here is attacking this building. Basically, buildings like a skyscraper have a defense value or armor value of five and one structure point. They can take one point of damage. Uh, the attacker, Otachi in this case, would just attack normally. So we know from the previous example, Otachi will attack with six dice in melee with just a standard attack. We've got three hits plus a, cr a critical. So we've got three hits total. And then the, the other player would roll the building's defense dice. We only got two successes there, but they're critical successes. So we rolled four versus Otachi's three. Poor Otachi in these examples is just not cutting it. Uh, so the building would withstand that attack. But let's say you just rolled two defense successes. In that case, the building is destroyed and Otachi would gain one rage. So the rage marker would go up. A lot of scenarios you get points for destroying buildings or bonus points for destroying buildings. So 
sometimes that can be really advantageous to add to your, your scoreboard. And then you just remove the building from the, ba the battlefield. So the nice thing to remember is movement and combat are pretty straightforward in the game. Uh, the only thing that I would consider maybe slightly fiddly is movement when you've got things like buildings in between people or partially in between people. Um, you know, Otachi could not get into base contact with Gypsy directly because it would stop movement when it got to this building. So maybe this kaiju would have to run, turn 60 degrees, move one or two hexes, hexes here, turn 60 degrees, you know, do something like that so it could skirt and still hit Gypsy. It's a lot harder for Jaegers who can't do uh, turns before, they can only do it after. So for example, if Gypsy wanted to move and not hit this building, it's going to have to pivot beforehand and then move. Which you can't do normally, it has to move and then pivot, so Gypsy would just have to pivot during its turn and then next turn be able to move. There are some cards, again like Run, um, that lets you move twice, so you could do that in, in one turn. Next we're going to talk about a more advanced rule, but it's kind of cool. It's um, a lot of the Jaegers, so this is just the Jaeger side, have the deep drift that all of them may have it, which uh, lets you activate your pilot abilities. It costs one charge, and then you can do a melee attack. So by activating pilot abilities, it means on each one of these pilot cards, we have a list of abilities. I'll try not to get the glare there. So for example, example Makomori has accurate disengage and activate chain sword. Um, both, or in the case of Jaegers that have three pilots, you would activate uh, all three of the pilots. So when you play Deep Drift and pay your one charge, you activate everything on this pilot and that pilot. So in this case with Raleigh and Mako, uh, that is seven um, special rules basically that are active. All right, so that's just an example of Deep Drift and the bonuses that it can give you in combat. And with that, let's move on to the uh, end of round. So after all of your either Kaijus or Jaegers have activated, everyone has gone, there's no more face-up cards on the table, um, then we go to the end of round. First thing we do is we roll for reserves. Some mission types have reserves. Uh, the way reserves work is on turn one you roll one combat die looking for a success and if you do your Reserve comes in according to whatever uh, mission you're playing. Each mission tells you, you know, it comes in on your player edge or it drops on the board anywhere or something like that. But the mission will tell you. Um, and then on turn two, if you don't get it on turn one, you roll two dice on turn two, three dice on turn, turn three, and so on until you get that one success and uh, bring in your, your guy. So um, then you deal with reserves and then you go to the... Uh, you check for the end of the game. You only do that starting on turn four. So at the end of turn four, um, each player rolls a die and basically it goes on if you get less than four successes. Now you do count um, critical successes so that do explode. Um, you each roll two die or one die. So there's two dice total at the end of round four. Then each player rolls two dice at the end of round five three dice at the end of round six and so on until you get four or more successes. So usually with those dice it's going to end around turn six, uh, five or six depending on just luck. So it's never um, a set end turn so you can't just count on the game always ending at a particular time. Um, but beyond that if the game doesn't end you just move the uh, the round tracker one more space so you're on to the next turn and then you just rinse and repeat you lay out your cards and so on all right so there you go that's the end of the round uh, part of the game pretty straightforward and with that that pretty much covers a uh, basic how to play pacific rim extinction there are some more 
Um, advanced rules in the rule book, I'm not going to go over every single one because the video would be a lot longer, uh, but it gets you started. Uh, this hopefully will be a good reference for those who are interested in the game. I uh, also have additional Pacific Rim Extinction content on the channel. I have individual Kaiju and Jaeger um, unboxings where we look at the miniature a little bit closer and also all the cards and stuff that it comes with. And uh, you can look forward to a battle report or two being on the channel here um, somewhat soon, probably in the next month or so. So I hope you enjoyed this. If you do, please do consider giving us a like and subscribe. Click that bell to receive notification when we release new content. If you have any questions or comments or rules that uh, you'd like answered or rules that I got wrong, please don't hesitate to let us know down in the comments below as well. As always, thanks for watching and keep on gaming.